It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Eric Bolt, who will be talking about uh, geometric consideration of uh, good dictionary for Kuhlman analysis of dynamical systems. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, can I ask real quick, do you see this screen on the side where I see all of you? No, we don't see it, no. Okay, you just see the, you just see the slides. Yes. Good. Um, so a little map where you are. If you want to come to me, you fly across the ocean. I mean, the point is, I'm right where the dot is. Way upstate New York, um, New York City is way down here. Um, so actually there's two parts to this talk. The first part was um, what Hamzi uh, asked uh, that maybe I should suggest talk this, which is this title, Geometric Considerations of a Good Dictionary for Koopman. Um, and, um, I really want to close this because it's blocking some of my screen. Uh, hide. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pause one second. Pointer. Okay, good. Now that's not hiding all my screen. And then a second very related part, which is a actually a different paper, but uses many of the same tools. We'll see how far we get. So this is a bit of a look under the hood, as I see, like looking inside the engine of a car um, on uh, evolution operators, transfer operators, and uh, very much trending right now is uh, Koopman spectral analysis. Many of you may have known me for some time. I come from, uh, um, in this story, I come from the adjoint side from Fubrini's prone operator, which I spent quite some time on. I have a book on once upon a time. Um, so it's, it's nice to move across the bilinear form to the Koopman side. And I'm gonna to try to show you some um, bits on this topic, which um, I find very interesting. So one is that there's many eigen, more eigenfunctions than you may think. And uh, then I'll move on from uh, describing all the eigenfunctions to a bit of flexibility in choosing which ones. And then after that will be some work in comparing dynamical systems, meaning change of coordinates through the, uh, um, the eigenfunctions. So Kuban operator is often presented as a composition operator. Um, so suppose this is a state in terms of a flow. So uh, suppose I have a ODE, we can do it in terms of maps, you can do it in terms of non-autonomous flows, we can do it in terms of, of there's a version in terms of PDE, but for specific, let's suppose I have an ODE and this autonomous form of D dimensional space, then there may be a, 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 a corresponding flow map. Um, and instead of watching an individual trajectory, so goes the Koopman story, let me say I'm gonna measure something in the space, in the phase space. So suppose I give you a function G, in the space. So you need to pick a space of functions G. The analysis that I present will be uh, nicer if we just stick in L2. Um, so suppose I have a space of measurable functions G, then I can ask how does the dynamics act on the flow? And so the Koopman idea is um, I apply the Koopman operator um, across the time T with respect to the flow to the function and I evaluate it at point X and the, out, the new function will be basically that function measured downstream. So this is just a picture. So at a point X, I could measure G, but instead I'll look downstream, I'll measure G there and report the answer back at X. So that's the Koopman idea. It's a very simple idea. It's a composition operator in this sense. Um, and it takes functions and it essentially uh, gives you new functions by composition. It turns out it's a linear operator. Um, it turns out it's adjoint of the Fabrinius Prawn operator. So that's a bit of a story in my old book. Um, so the Fabrinius Prawn operator is about evolution of density, and the Koopman operator is about um, uh, ob observable functions as measured downstream. And they end up being adjoint to each other in the story. So the Koopman operator statement I just made, one can check that it, it can be stated in terms of a, uh, um, a delta function measure downstream, that's what this says. And um, if I think of reversing the X and the Y in this story, I would get this statement, which as it turns out is um, the pullback, the, uh, the Fabrinius Cron operator. So that's nice. And this is why it's um, 
straightforward for a fitness product operator person to move into the equipment side. So it turns out, and you can convince yourself by looking at that, um, that interval operator I just showed you, presentation of composition, that it is a linear operator. So you may ask, as a linear as an interval operator, it classifies as a linear operator. It, um, you can ask yourself, maybe there's eigenfunctions. Um, and an eigenfunction would mean, so normally you say Koopman on G means G measured downstream, but instead an eigenfunction would say that would equal to the function, but perhaps scaled. Um, so it's an eigen, it's, it's somehow stationary in a way, except it's scaled. So what this means is if I'm an eigenfunction G, then in the space that's on the floor here, in the space I, at an initial condition, I flow forward and I get a new value. I get, I measure G downstream and report it back here. But instead I have a special function such that when I do this measurement downstream, I essentially have something that's always a fraction of what it was before. And so moving along this arc um, above the flow, it's going to look essentially like an exponential decay. So it has to be a special function that's fitted for the flow that looks like this in each slice along the flow. And that's what this um, algebraic statement should mean geometrically. Um, a nice way to either find Koopman eigenfunctions or define them, I'm going to use it this both ways, is to think about its infinitesimal generator. So again, I'm saying this for an ODE. Um, x dot equals f of x. So I can think of saying how much does the g change in time infinitesimally, which is I can think of just as chain rule, g dot equals d g d of g of z, which uh, working out through the full derivative gives me um, in chain rule in each component if it was a multivariate function. So this chain rule, and then collecting terms, it looks like grad g dot z dot and z dot um, would be the f of z, the vector field. So grad g dot f of z is what g dot would be. That's the Koopman operator. But now what I would like to say is, what if this thing, the infinitesimal generator, equals to um, lambda g? So this statement here would be a requirement for um, g to be an eigenfunction. Otherwise, just g dot equals grad g dot f is what the operator does. So you can work that all this um, this chain rule idea all up through the whole formalism of infinitesimal generators, which is what this is getting into, and then track the space of functions on which this works. But now I'm just going to focus on this as a PDE. Okay, here we have a PDE. Grad g dot f equals lambda g. So um, I like to think in terms of examples. So let's think of this example. X dot equals x squared. That'll be my f. I'm calling it F1 because later in the talk, I'm gonna use it compared to another function and I'll call it F2. So that'll be my vector field. I'm in 1D just to keep um, life simple. This is a well-known uh, ODE if you ever taught um, uh, differential equations. It's kind of the first example you would show for blow up in finite time. This is what its stream function looks like. So there's time versus Z of T. I'm, when I draw pictures, I seem to want to call it Z when I draw uh, as the equation we want to call it x. x and z are the same in this slide. So z of t. So for any initial condition, I'm increasing and I blow up in finite time. At some fixed finite time, I'm heading to infinity. You can see that by solving this equation in closed form, x of t equals one over this stuff, um, one over x zero minus t. So x zero is the initial condition. It's easy to see you blow up at finite time, one over x zero. So at t's time. Okay, that's my closed form solution. But for the Koopman eigenfunction, I said, let's solve for G, let's solve grad G dot F equals lambda G. So since it's one variable, grad G really just means DG DX. So DG DX X squared, that's my F, equals lambda G. So there's a nice ODE in G, unknown G. Um, using standard methods, integrating factors in this case, you can solve g of x equals e to the minus lambda over x. So that is a eigenfunction. And, um, and but basically ignore the, the integrating constant because usually when you talk about eigenvectors, eigenfunctions, you don't care about scale. In fact, you, it's convenient just often to normalize to one. 
So I'm calling e to the minus lambda over x. And you'll notice that um, the lambda, there's a legitimate eigenfunction for every lambda. And that's kind of interesting and fun. In fact, we typically think of lambda can even be from complex numbers. That's for later. So e to the minus lambda over x. It's kind of a crazy function because um, this is a classic function that's presented in complex analysis if x is complex for an essential singularity. So it has a huge, it has a, a tremendously strong singularity at x is zero. And that's not really a surprise because I'm trying to pretend that this nonlinear differential equation is really like a linear differential equation. And I can do that in, um, in open regions that stay away from the, the uh, singularity. But at some point, um, there's too much distortion that goes on to try to make it really as if it's a linear system. So that will make more sense later in the talk. But anyway, this is the eigenfunction. You can check it's an eigenfunction directly by composition, even though I solved for it by, uh, by the infinitesimal generator. By composition, it just means plug it into the operator. So what is the composition of this guy downstream? So for the x, I should plug in this x of t, which is what this says. And then properties of exponentials, it splits up. And sure enough, you get e to lambda t g. Good, it's an eigenfunction. So we're all warmed up. Here's another example, and I have a point with this one. I'm going to start counting eigenfunctions. So um, there's an algebraic property for Koopman eigenfunctions that uh, has some uh, interesting consequences. So there's lots and lots of eigenfunctions. So here's a even simpler example. Y dot equals F, and I'll choose F to be Y. So it's just the linear system Y dot equals Y. So everyone can solve this. Y of t is e to the t, y zero. The um, eigenfunction equation is grad gf, meaning um, dg dy y equals length g. So I can solve that guy again by integrating factors and I get g of x equals y to the lambda for any lambda. And I don't really care about the constant. Y the lambda for any lambda. So usually when this is, um, this problem is presented, most people would pick lambda equals one and say g of y equals y is an eigenfunction. And that's true. That's called the state observer. The reason it's called state observer is um, for any value y, I just tell you where you are, just repeat what's the y. But besides this y, I also have it to other powers, any power you like for any lambda, any real number, actually any complex number. So there's a lot more eigenfunctions than you may have guessed for this guy. So it's a one-dimensional ODE. Sometimes it may be in a, a one-dimensional nonlinear ODE. And, um, but nonetheless, you get infinitely many um, eigenfunctions. And where do they come from? So that's a bit of the story of this, um, this whole talk. Um, one way to think of where they come from is there, it's well known, this property, it's called the algebraic property of eigenfunctions. So this just says if I have one eigenfunction and eigenvalue, so phi lambda one, lambda one, and phi lambda two, lambda two, then I can get a new eigenfunction eigenvalue pair by multiplying the eigenfunctions, perhaps the exponents, and adding the eigenvalues in a linear, in a uh, convex way like this. So with that in mind, when I, okay, this, this is almost the same problem, x side equals ax. It has eigen, the observer eigenfunction x with eigenvalue a, and I can make new eigenfunction eigenvalue pairs, 2a x squared just by exponentiating this guy x squared, and then I throw the exponent in front, so 2a, or I can cube it, x cubed, and 3a, and so forth. I can do square root of x, and then have a over two is its eigenvalue. So you can see any powers, and that agrees with what I showed you by direct derivation, which is x to the lambda. In this gives the x to the lambda over a. For lambda is any complex number. So there's already infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenfunction pairs. I've kind of gotten the habit of these Koopman eigenfunctions. We're calling them kiges, which means both together, a and x. That's my own homegrown notation, um, kiges. So it, this is not the whole story. So one thing I found in this work I'm showing to you is besides the algebraic property, 
Um, there isn't just a nuisance of finding what is the real or the main eigenfunction, and there's a notion of primary uh, uh, principal eigenfunction by uh, Mezik et al. Um, but something I'm going to call primary eigenfunction, which captures um, that there's freedom in choosing initial conditions once I get to multivariate. So there's lots more eigenfunctions than even you might think, even though there's already infinitely many. So I'm going to skip that. Where do they come from? They come in the multivariate case. So the Kubin PDE, I showed you earlier, this one, um, I called it G, now it's called phi for eigenfunction, um, is grad phi dot F equals lambda phi. So inspecting this with the eye of a PDE person, it's actually a very simple form of PDE, one that gives rise to characteristics. It's called a quasi-linear PDE. So this is material that I've taught just in my normal teaching duties um, for boundary value problems. And my favorite book on that topic is an old book by Fritz John. And he describes nicely how to derive the method of characteristics. So the method of characteristics in 2D, it's easier just to state it in a specific dimension instead of general. In 2D, I would say, suppose I have a problem of this form. A U X plus B U Y equals C. And the ABC are functions of X, Y, and U. Um, I could think of placing a data surface um, in the space. So suppose I pose that, um, that PD in an open set U, and I'm going to place a, a, a data surface, a co-dimensional one surface in that space. So in this case, the curve for my drawing. And I parameterize the surface like so. So F1, F2 parameterize the curve. And on the curve, I'm going to place a function h. So h is a function of where I am on the curve. It turns out by method of characteristics, um, you get from this PDE a ODE describing the characteristic curves. And the characteristic curves end up being um, uh, uh, dependent on the a and the, and the b, which are the coefficient functions. And in a, another space, um, Z, which I'll take to be where the solution is, and that is the right-hand side, C. So there's a longhand derivation of this, but it's actually very simple that you just assume that the Z is a function of X and Y, so the U I'm looking for. And I can take this explicit form and describe it in terms of implicit form like this, and then notice that the PDE is really, I can just rewrite it as grad u dot abc or ab minus c for the implicit form. And once I do that, you can think of this as a geometric statement that the, uh, the, the grad u is a normal surface and um, therefore a perpendicular surface must be perpendicular to the vector field. And that ends up telling you that the vector field must be abc the one I just stated. So that's just a quick fly through of the discussion you'd find in any classic book like Fritz John. Long story short is um, once I have a Koopman um, eigenfunction PDE, I realize it's just a method of characteristics and I can solve it. So for example, let's take x1 dot equals a1x, x2 dot equals a2x. Now Koopman's much more interesting if I'm not just solving linear problems, but it's easy to present for linear problems when I'm doing closed form solutions. Anyway, for this guy, the, uh, the characteristic equations are like so, right? So they're just the ODEs repeated again, but ex except now in terms of this implicit variable. And then another equation, dz dr equals lambda z picks up that lambda z, right, that lambda phi, and that describes the exponential growth. So this guy I can solve in closed form and you get just what you would expect, except now in terms of arc length variables, S e to the A1R, Y equals um, E to the A2R, and then the Z variable, which is really my phi, um, the E to the lambda R times an H of S. And this is why I'm going through the whole thing formally. You pick up this H of S. So putting these guys in, this is the punchline. My eigenfunction is X2, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the transverse. I didn't tell you which surface to choose. You need to pick a surface. So I'm going to pick a surface here to be um, x1 equals a constant like one. 
And if I do that, then propagating along that surface, um, I get powers of x2, x2 to the lambda, um, times something that depends on um, the initial data at h, the h function. Remember, h function stated along the, the curve or my initial data surface. So if I look at this, I say, you know what? How many fees do I have? I have a fee for each lambda like before, but also something that has a lot of freedom on my h, the h I choose. And h, so the implicit variable s you can solve out too. H depends on um, some kind of funny combination of the X's. Okay, I'm gonna start really hitting on that. So huh, I, I ended up hiding my, uh, my equation. This is the same equation, X1 dot equals A1X, X2 dot equals A2X. And I solved for that. That's the, that's the solution. In a general form, um, by method of characteristics, you can show that this is a solution for a general ODE. So how do I read this? So this theorem from my paper says how to read this. There's something very similar in a paper by Korda and Mezik. I derived this by uh, method of characteristics and they have other means. And so a bit of the uh, hypothesis is different, but otherwise the result is mostly the same. So for an ODE, this one or any other one, um, as long as you have existence and uniqueness of solutions in a domain U, um, you say, okay, what's my fee for a given X? So for a given X, suppose I have an X where that dot is on my screen. I say, pull it back along the flow, run the flow backwards until I hit Lambda and record where I am on Lambda. So at Lambda um, uh, is parameterized by S. So that's what this function says. Where am I on from X? Where do I land on Lambda? Call it S, S star. So evaluate H there. That's why H is composed with S star. So evaluate H there. And I also want to record the time it took me to pull back. Call that um, negative R. So R star will be the time it takes to flow from the surface to the X I'm looking at. And the eigenfunction at any point X is just E to the lambda R star. So this is a well-defined quantity and that defines the fee in terms of quantities from the flow. So again, from a given X, pull back, measure the S, at S measure H, and then push it forward again, and then do the exponentiation in the right way with respect to the lambda you chose. So there we are. How many eigenfunctions do I have for any lambda? Um, I For any one lambda, I have infinitely many H's. I have freedom in choosing H. So this is nothing like if you're used to eigenfunctions or eigenvectors and eigenvalues for matrices, which are finite ring operators, because for any one lambda, I have infinitely many eigenfunctions. In fact, I have as many eigenfunctions as H's, and um, I can choose H's uh, to be C1. In, in, in a setup for this guy. So I have uncountably many H's. So you might find that a bit odd. Right? I did it first. Okay, so continuing with this example, um, X1 dot equals A1X, X2 dot equals A2X. Um, this was my eigenfunction for any H. So, and this was for a surface, um, a, uh, a lambda surface, that I took to be lambda equals, um, excuse me, x1 equals to one. So that would be where this line is. And if I choose the h to be the identity function, then I just get x2 to the lambda over a2, which is what you typically would state with lambda equals to a2, then it's just x2. And that's called the observer function. And the algebraic property I said would allow you to have um, various exponents of that. So I can square it, I can cube it, I can square root it, and I can get lots more. So even thinking in terms of the algebraic property, I get lots of eigenfunctions. But what I just showed you said there's a whole bunch more, as many as freedom of choosing H, and in some sense along each orbit, H is independent. Anyway, here's a one eigenfunction stated for um, H is one. 
and this is drawn as an eigenfunction in a domain x1, x2, and I'm showing you level sets. Here's another eigenfunction for h is equal to, h of s is equal to s, and you get these funny um, hyperbolas. Um, and uh, it would be this function, x1, x2 to a funny exponent. And then I ask myself, are these really the same eigenfunction, but somehow different? And then the way to decide that would be, do they intersect transversely or not? So to decide if they intersect transversely, what you want to do is take a, a dot product between um, the gradient on the flow and the perp of the gradient. So I mean, the level sets, the, the gradient of the level sets of one eigenfunction against the gradient, um, dot against the, the perp gradient of one of the eigen, other eigenfunctions and see if you get zero or not. And so for this explicit example, it's easy to see when you work out the, uh, the, the calculus that you don't get zero. In fact, you get this function, which for general x's is not zero. And that's the general story. So I have this stated in a general sense, but it's just simply testing that eigenfunctions of this general form typically get level sets that intersect transversely, which is what this picture showing on the right. So then I started saying, well, how shall I uh, um, understand all these different eigenfunctions? So I, I cooked up this thing I call primary eigenfunctions or primary kinds. So this bar over it means a quotient set. So I'll say this quotient set of phi lambda and a lambda, the eigenvalue that goes with, would be an equivalence class of all those eigenfunctions which have something the same. That's what the equals dot is. So the something the same is the same set of level sets. And I chose it that way because I, I, I realized that um, if you have one eigenfunction and its eigenvalue, the algebraic property lets you exponentiate it. So for example, I showed you x was an eigenfunction of one system. So the x1. x1 might be an eigenfunction of one system. And if I exponentiate it, I would have x1 squared and then x1 cubed, and x1 to the fourth. And I say, well, those are really the same in the sense that they all came from the algebraic property. So is there a geometric property that understands that? And that is, yes, they have the same set of level sets. So here, just to demonstrate that, here is for this, um, this was the, um, all those eigenfunctions that came by direct computation and x to the lambda over a. And um, this is, it for lambda equals a, here's the square, and here's the square root, and I just looked at the level sets, and you can see that, of course, as obvious, they have the same set of level sets. So I want to say these are really the same thing in the sense of the algebraic property, so that's what this is meant to capture. And um, so a primary eigen is the quotient set, and it's nice to uh, associate with a primary um, eigen, as I call it, uh, one main one to hang your hat on, so for this one, I would call this, the whole set is the primary chi, but I think of this one, it's the easiest one to look at as the, uh, the identifier for it. So the, um, the uh, 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 observer eigenfunction. Um, so what I've been arguing through, and there's a proof in the paper that um, the algebraic property generates a primary chi. So that, that sucks up a lot of the infinity of eigenfunctions due to the, um, uh, the, the uh, algebraic property, but there's more. Oh, and so I forgot to point at these. So the principal eigenfunction concept of Moore and Mesic is partly covered in this. And there's been some really nice work recently in that topic by Velheim and uh, Revzin. So I'm now gonna, it's gonna start working forward to a more general statement, but again, in terms of, of an example. So I've been doing a lot with uh, either 1D nonlinear or multivariate linear. So let's just kind of keep pressing forward with a multivariate nonlinear. So I'm choosing these because I know how to solve them in closed form, but nothing about the analysis requires that you can do everything closed form. It's just that your answer would be in terms of reading this thing. So if I want an eigenfunction of something I can, can call, solve in closed form, they can literally from a point X, pull it back um, in closed form to the, the lambda um, surface and read off the S star and the R star. If I don't have it in closed form, that would be more like a shooting process, like just like you typically do with 
numerical solution of Poincaré section, you pull the flow back to until you hit a surface. And I can still use this and get a useful interpretation of the fee. But for presentation, I'm sticking with problems I know how to solve in closed form. So here's a nice nonlinear ODE that you might recognize. Um, it shows up, it's kind of the typical normal form for Hopkins bifurcation. So um, here it is in polar coordinates. And then we see uh, we see the standard, um, I'm sorry, I just forgot the name of the, the bifurcation that is associated with 1D. Oh, I forgot the name of my normal form. This is a standard normal form, but I'm going to choose it for mu is equal to one. And so this is a stream plot of that guy. You see that it has a stable limit cycle at lambda, I mean, at radius equals one. So anybody in the inside except for the origin converges to the limit cycle. Anybody in the outside of the circle one converges to the limit cycle at one. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to find some Koopman eigen functions. So let's write out the linear operator. So here's, this is basically the resolvent equation, which is how you find eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Um, F dot um, Laplacian, let me say F, F dot um, gradient minus lambda I against the phi. I'm going to choose R is bigger than square root of lambda. And, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I skipped to state something. You can solve this guy in closed form, it's straightforward. So R of T is this thing. This is a closed form solution of this equation for any, um, any initial condition. This is written in, in radial coordinates. Um, anyway, um, plugging all the quantities in here and proceeding um, off, off scene, um, the, the eigenfunction can be written like this. So you have something that's an e to the quantities in radius and um, x's. So this r would be initial radius wherever I might be. And this is stated for a uh, um, an initial surface, which I choose to be a circle that is larger than the limit cycle. So any surface larger than a certain limit cycle, a radius big R. And e to the this stuff for any particular position um, captures the time um, for a given x12. That's the pullback time. So this funny quantity and h evaluated at the various positions. I left the t in here because it gets really ugly to pull it out. But with this, you can invert out the t as well, which you would do in practice. And then the tan with a little squiggle on top, that's a notation I like for tan inverse. When you're discussing the uh, it's called in MATLAB a tan two, or you can think of it as the two quadrant version of the tangent. It, it's aware of which quadrant you're in to assign a unique angle for each x and x, x one, x two pair. So you can have a closed form solution for the feet. So there it is. And again, it has freedom in choosing h. For any lambda, there's my lambda. If I choose h to be some constant, then I have infinitely many eigenfunctions. Um, I said that backwards. For any fixed h, I have infinitely many eigenfunctions for different lambdas. On the other hand, for any fixed lambda, I have infinitely many eigenfunctions due to the freedom in choosing h. So um, let's choose a um, choose a, a lambda, a big lambda, which is the name of the, uh, the the data surface, to be something greater than the limit cycle. And I'm going to show you several different H's. So choosing H is equal to one. This is um, a eigenfunction in a domain that is all, so this would be a U that is um, the set, which is the punctured annulus. So um, the annulus being outside the limit cycle. So this eigenfunction is not defined on the inside or on the limit cycle, but outside the limit cycle. And you can see these level sets are simply these nice um, concentric circles, which pile up in a way that has something to do with um, this exponentiation. If I, for the same eigenvalue, I choose H to be S along the curve, I get these. So this is a, a drawing of the um, phi, the eigenfunction and its level sets. 
So at, at the level sets presentation of the eigenfunction. So if I choose it to be S squared, again, I get something else again, which isn't a surprise. We had cho Freeman choosing H. So I wanted to uh, show what different kinds of H's might give. So I might ask, is this and this the same? And the way to see that would be um, to draw them at the same time or think of them at the same time um, and see if the level sets are parallel or if they um, cross transversely. And the picture suggests they cross transversely and makes a pretty pattern. To test in general if they cross transversely would be what I like to get after. And that ends up being a theorem. So, so uh, same data surface, different eigenfunctions. So an H and another H on the same data surface, which is that circle, um, state of data function. It could be any complex function is um, legit, complex valued function is legit. It ends up yield, yielding different primary um, Koopman eigenfunctions. And again, primary in my definition was in terms of the set of level sets. So if they have different level sets, they can't be from the same primary eigenfunction. And um, that's generally true unless a funny condition shows up. I call this a compatibility condition. So this would be H and H squiggle with the other eigenfunction evaluated at any Y on the, on the surface. So that's a vector dotted against something similar, but the derivative. So this is derivative along the arc length. Um, so if this is equal to zero, then they would be the same primary eigenfunction. And since this is just one equation, um, the general statement is they would not. So where did this come from? It just came from the computation I showed you earlier stated in the general terms. What I should be doing is any point X and Y, I, or any point in the space, I should be looking at um, the, the gradient of phi against the perp gradient of phi and dot product them and see if I get zero or not. So since I have an expression for, um, for phi, remember that was this guy, then I can plug that in for two different H's. So that's what I did in a longhand form. And there's a lot of algebra that happened behind the scenes, a lot of algebra, a lot of grouping of terms and eventually you get an expression like this one. And the main part is this thing that I picked out for the theorem. And there's actually another part, which I'm hiding in the statement of the theorem, but it has, this has to do with um, a, a, how the surface lies relative to the flow, because remember R star um, and S star were both time and position along the flow. But anyway, the, the, the main takeaway is generally um, you end up getting different primary eigenfunctions. So that's an answer to a question that I've been kind of following on my nose along this whole discussion, which is how many eigen, how many primary eigenfunctions are there? Because primary already sucks up all the infinity that has to do with the algebraic property. And there's still infinitely many primary eigenfunctions or cut tags. And in fact, it's not just infinity, it's not just uncountably infinite, it's more than that, it's the cardinality of initial functions that I can place on H, distinct primary kikes. Okay, so there's so many eigenfunctions. Now I'm gonna to try to change gears and stop counting and say, well, maybe I wanna do something with them. So let's talk, this is my efficiency part of that paper I showed you. So let's talk efficiency. So what do people typically do with these eigenfunctions is they represent um, the dynamics of observables. So that means I have my flow. So I think of like in the ocean, you have like um, heat moves around in the ocean. And I would like to understand at, in time at a given position, what's the heat? What's the temperature? Um, and maybe you want to represent that as, as in a series representation in terms of basis functions. And a very popular way to present that is in terms of Koopman eigenfunctions as the series. So um, that gets us into the DMD world, which is a numerical implementation from data of Koopman eigenfunctions. Based on what I've just showed you, there's a lot more eigenfunctions than you may have guessed. And I can ask the efficiency question, which is, are there eigenfunctions which are the best ones to represent a given data function? So I state that like this. So given a data function Q, 
is there an eigenfunction phi for a given lambda um, so that, I shouldn't say for a given lambda, is there an eigenfunction phi so that this error is minimized? And if it is, I'll call the argman, argman var phi. And I'm going to minimize this over lambdas and, and data functions because it's data functions that specify eigenfunctions. So this leads to something that I kind of, I named in the funny way people are doing in DMD world, which is adding acronyms onto DMD. DMD stands for dynamic mode decomposition. And if anything, this would be a Koopman eigenfunction extended version of dynamic mode decomposition. So that acronym. This has kind of been the spirit of um, an older method in uh, numerical or data-driven dynamical systems called POD, uh, principal orthogonal decomposition or kahunan loev analysis in terms of minimizing something like this, although the details are totally different. Okay, so um, I wanna minimize something like this guy for a Q, which I would specify over the phase space. So for something to grab on a look to, here's that um, hop flow again. And suppose I pose a, uh, a function Q over it like heat or temperature. And I wanna find an eigenfunction or eventually a set of eigenfunctions that represents the dynamics I show you in terms of a Q I give you. It turns out it just works out to a linear problem. So first thing to notice, this is easy to show, this is classic, um, that minimizing this quantity, which is um, least squares residual, is the same thing as maximizing projection onto a fee. So finding a fee that's closest to the data is like finding a fee that, that Q projects on maximally. So the, min, the argmin turns into an argmax in terms of, of inner product, using the standard inner product of functions over the space um, U. And that's why all along I said, by the way, we want to work in L2. It's so I can do this, this thing and minim, do this optimization problem. Okay. Now, this is kind of my cartoon of the method. So suppose I have that, that data surface lambda, and I'm going to think of it as a grid now. So the data surface lambda is I'm tracing out with my, my laser pointer. Um, and I'm going to put a grid of positions S0, S1, S2 along it. And for each S that parameterizes the lambda, I can read off my phase space coordinate X, X, S0, S, X, S1, and so forth. And from any one of those X's like X, S0, I can push forward in time this way and um, that's with the flow. So that's what this is stating. The S I J would be a matrix of, this is the name of the flow, this um, funny row in time R from any position X along the arc length. So a grid on the surface <clears throat> pushes forward in uniform steps in time in a some sort of squiggly curve sampled on that same grid. So in other words, I have a grid in space and I'm just named that grid SIJ and I can think of it as just a, a data array like this, where once I'm not worrying about the space, I'm just recording it in a big matrix. Um, I can think of it as if it were a square grid, but it's not a square grid, it's a nonlinear squiggly grid. So the minimization problem I wanna do is estimated by the same minimization problem stated at points on the grid and ideally you'd have a fine grid for convergence. So this equation here and this equation here are the same except I'm sampling on the grid. And since I'm sampling it on the grid, I'm no longer minimizing in L2, I'm minimizing just in terms of a square norm sum over all the positions and so this is stated in terms of a big matrix, so Frobenius norm. Um, and here it's stated, it's the same thing, summing up over all R's and I's, so I's and J's. So this is the um, my data function sampled I and J's on those positions, right? So now the nice thing to notice is writing this equation out, which just means this guy on the grid is really a linear problem, which isn't a surprise because the operator is linear in the first place. That's what's kind of interesting about Koopman 
in the first place is we're studying nonlinear systems through a linear analysis where the nonlinearity is kind of swept up in the sense that you're not really paying attention to the nonlinearity because the uh, um, even though the curve would, um, traces out in, in a nonlinear way along the space, I'm only measuring it at uniform time stamps and uniform positions. So it's as if I'm on a square grid. And in any case, this statement I made, I wrote it out this way. And if you stare at this guy, this equation and the double sum, you'll realize it's actually a lot like a matrix equation, A H, where the A is this E to the lambda R at each time. So A H can be written as this vector I call E lambda and E lambda is just along a given fixed position X it's e to the lambda first time, e to the lambda second time, e to the lambda all the way to e to the lambda last time. So that would be this e vector. And then I just copy it over many times. So the way you copy a vector over many times so that it applies to each of the positions is through Kronecker product. So this A lambda is a highly structured matrix and it's just built by Kronecker product. So AH times the data matrix vector, which is the sample of the data uh, function on the surface, um, is what this part of the statement is. And then the B, the B is just Q, reshaped. So Q is um, the function stated on the entire grid, and I reshape it to be one long column vector, so the reshape command. And now I have just one big matrix statement. And I'm minimizing it in terms of the two norm, and I'm trying to minimize A, H equals B in two norm, and there we are. There's our old friend, the least squares problem, ordinary least squares. So without showing the solution of the ordinary least squares, it's, it's very straightforward. It's just do it by matrix operations. I do it by uh, principle, uh, by uh, P, I, and V, um, Penrose pseudo inverse. So now I'm saying, and the lambda is built in. So now I like to minimize this guy and take it argmin and call it. Um, the only unknown here is the H and the lambda. So I'm going to call the argmin um, H1 lambda 1. And I'm going to put a little zero here for it's the first time I'm running the problem. And the P1, which is not the B I actually was trying to hit, but it's the, that B I actually hit, so P1 lambda uh, zero, I'll call this product that came out of using the argument. And I'll call the um, reshape of the P1 to the space, I'll call that my eigenfunction, my first eigenfunction, P1 zero. I can keep doing this. So once I have that, I have an, a notion of residual and I can add, so I've to run this as a, an iterative algorithm. I can take the first one and compare it to the original B. Remember the B is the reshape of the, the target Q um, and uh, pick up a, uh, a V10 and then a V11 and a V12 and so forth through K. And I have a residual after K steps. And so basically this is a vector version of what would be estimating in terms of eigenfunctions through k eigenfunctions, my residual, my, my target q, and there would always be a remaining residual. So this is just running least squares a bunch of times on a carefully designed grid with this funny, um, this funny matrix. And so this process is what I'm calling KEEDMD. Let's run that guy on um, an example problem. So this is a bit like the hop flow because it has a limit cycle. This is our old friend, the Vanderpool oscillator. So here's Vanderpool. Um, x1 dot equals x2, x2 dot equals x2 1 minus x1 squared minus x1. And over this space, so we can see the limit cycle in x, this is x1 and x2. Over this space, um, I'm going to put a uh, uh, a function q, and um, 
you run this whole method in terms of a domain and a data function and a data function on a data surface. So I'm going to state this Q, um, but I'm going to measure it on a, uh, on a red data surface. That's this guy. So this means it's over, see this is from minus, excuse me, from X1 is 1.5 to 3.5 and um, X2 is almost three to four. So that's up here somewhere. So it diagonals this way and that red line sweeps out this way in time and it sweeps out this domain U. So in this U, I'm gonna measure the Q and try to estimate it in terms of eigenfunctions, best eigenfunctions. So running through the process I showed you, here's a set of best eigenfunctions, the first four. So the best eigenvalues, uh, the first best eigenvalue, well, here's all the eigenvalues, just sweeping the eigenvalues. And the best eigenvalue has a distinct um, minimizer and, and error. And that's a number a little bit bigger than zero. It's like 0.1 something. So once I believe that, I can pick out the corresponding eigenfunction, which would be generated by an H. This isn't the eigenfunction. This is the H that generates the eigenfunction. So this H is stated in terms of arc length, um, scaled from zero to one, scaled across the part I'm showing you. So um, this is, it looks like a straight line, but it actually ends up being slightly curved, but you can't see in the picture. So once I have that guy, then, um, I subtract that out and start, I can start looking for the second eigenfunction and eigenvalue. So the second eigenvalue, um, it ends up having a minimum on the low end. And this is the eigen, this is the generator of that eigenfunction. And then the third and the fourth, a minimum and a minimum over here, and they have all their own funny shapes. So if I keep going that through many eigenfunctions, um, this I designed this guy to be funny. Um, you can decide it to be, um, a bit easier to work with, but I decided I designed it to be hard to work with. And so it actually ends up picking up a lot of eigenfunctions. And often you might say, stop the process when there's what's called an elbow in the error occurs. So this is error versus K, the number of eigenfunctions. And by design, the residual goes down uh, with, I, with uh, more and more eigenfunctions. Uh, faster for this set of eigenfunctions than any other set of eigenfunctions. Okay. And there you go, that's, that's the first part of this discussion. Um, I showed you, or I reviewed the Koopman eigenfunction are solutions of some linear PDE. And there's a method of characteristic about propagating um, data functions. And that gives you a great deal of freedom in choosing eigenfunctions, even for a given eigenvalue. The cardinality of eigenfunctions, it depends not just on an algebraic property, but on your choice of, of initial functions. So these two play off of each other, the algebraic property and the cardinality. Then I gave you something called primary eigenfunctions, which um, is the quotient um, or the quotient set of eigenfunctions with the same set of level sets. Then I asked, is there more than just that? And there is because of the, uh, the freedom in choosing um, initial data functions. And then I kind of switched gears and I showed you that, um, that there's some freedom in choosing your eigenfunctions. And I designed this thing called optimal KEEDMD, which is um, optimal Koopman eigenfunctions. I'm gonna skip that. So that was this paper, which is kind of new. Very closely related to this paper, I'm gonna just show you some highlights from this one, is this um, was in my, this is where I learned to do um, uh, the method of characteristics in context of the Koopman eigenfunctions. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of this. This is with my friends uh, Chin Chao Li, uh, Felix Dietrich, and Yanis Kevrikides, who I think um, they've all been there at, in, uh, in uh, um, Imperial, and they're, I think, well known to you guys. So this was in SIAM in 2018 on matching and even rectifying dynamical systems through Koopman operators, eigenfunctions. So this was my banner problem. Suppose I have a two-dimensional flow whose vector field is this one. I chose this, pro this particular one to make my analysis easy, but the idea is general. So this would be like x1 dot, x2 dot is equal to this and this. So it's a two-dimensional vector field. 
from R2 to R2. So through, through the stuff I showed you already, um, grad, um, grad g dot f equals lambda g, I can solve for eigenfunctions. There's infinitely many, but here's two nice ones. Here's one eigenfunction, which is g1 equals x1 minus x2 squared. And here's another eigenfunction. And I chose them both to be easy to look at. And this was before I kind of had a hang of how many there really were. Um, but I'm going to plot their level curves. So the level curves of this guy are in red. The level curves of this guy are in black. So there they are. So this is level curves. And the, um, the flow, whatever it is, is going to run through this space. And here's the trick. It runs through this space in such a way that, think of this picture. They run through the space in such a way that as you go, each of the eigenfunctions is going to increase or decrease or perhaps oscillate according to e to the lambda t. So running through the red curves according to the flow, I'm going to think each time I tick through a level that I'm really going through something that's as if it were linear. And each time in the, along the same flow, taking through the black level sets, the spacing is important. I'm going to think I go through some other linear flow. So the thing to realize is actually what this, these level sets are showing you is it's almost like I can grab this, um, this uh, so you might want to look at my hands. I can't see my hands. I think you can. Um, if I can grab that space and just straighten it out. So these sets of level sets, there would be a transformation that straightens it out. So each one of these little squares is truly exactly a square. And if I did that, um, it's as if I would be linearizing the flow. And I wanted to make that idea rigorous. So here's how you make that idea rigorous. It's through the idea of, uh, uh, and for maps, when you want to say dynamical systems are equivalent, you say, um, through homeomorphism, and it, it preserves the dynamics, so you say conjugacy, or perhaps you want to say preserves it smoothly, so you say diffeomorphism. And for a flow, you say orbit equivalence, which means conjugacy for each time. So suppose I have two dynamical systems um, as flows. So x goes to x under a flow s1 of t, and y goes to y under a flow s2 of t, and suppose they're orbit equivalent. So that would mean that there's a change of variables from the x space to the y space that respects the two flows in this way. But let me look at it as the commuting diagram. I can flow forward under the first um, flow S1 and then change coordinates by H. Or I can change coordinates right away and flow cord and change coordinates by S2, flow by S2, and I'll get to the same thing. And that's... Um, that's what's usually meant by a commuting diagram. So um, H following S1 is equal to, um, no, H following, excuse me, I said it backwards. H following S2 is the same thing as S2 following H um, for each X. Now, if that's true, there's a theorem. Um, this isn't my theorem, this is a known theorem um, that if I have eigenfunctions for the first system, let me say it another way. If I have eigenfunctions for the second system, then there's a corresponding eigenfunction for the first system under the transformation. So y equals y equals h of x. So I can just take that y, plug it into the eigenfunction of the second system, and that produces an eigenfunction of the first system. And that's what this equation says. That's that's the theorem. And it's easy to check. Um, you, you just check it through um, the composition property of eigenfunctions. But that's the main thing. The eigenfunctions correspond to each other. Oh, and one more really strong um, little result. Oh, somebody, somebody just asked something. I don't, my mouse isn't getting there. Yeah, yeah the, no, I just said that you would uh, be back later. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, say again? No question. It wasn't the question. Oh, OK. Um, Here's, a, here's an important um, little tidbit to go with too. It's the same eigenvalue. When you have eigenfunctions that correspond through the orbit equivalence function h, then it ends up being the same eigenvalue. 
So it's the same eigenfunction, but transformed because of the same eigenvalue. So that's important, same eigenvalue. So um, that idea of, of just taking the flow and straightening it according to the level sets, um, I kind of, th I thought about taking this equation and turning it around. So turning it around would mean this. Normally you would use this equation by saying, I've got two systems and I know they're two eigen, I know the eigenfunctions of one, I know the change of variables between them so I can find the eigenfunctions of the other. But what if I have the eigenfunction for each and I don't know the transformation between them? So if I did that, I would wanna turn this guy around and invert the G to the other side. So let's just pretend I can do that for a second. And I would say the H is equal to G2 inverse G1. Now, um, there's a bunch of problems there. Like I don't know if G2 is really invertible. And generally it might not be. That's the main problem with this statement, but I'm just gonna follow my nose and pretend it is for a while. And really the way to resolve that is this process works in, in domains where this guy is single valued. So that, that's the main thing is to worry about um, domains and ranges and non-uniqueness, which I'm gonna sweep all that detail under the rug. And otherwise I'm going to be straightening out the flow in stages all the way to the simplest flow, which is gonna be the straight flow, which is often called the flow box theorem. So I'm kind of giving you a, a Koopman version of flow box theorem, which also goes by the synonym, rec, synonym, synonym rectify. Okay, I showed you this example earlier. So I'm going to show explicitly this process with a simple example. So I'm gonna compute two eigenfunctions between two systems and show you that actually transforms one into the other. So first system will be a nonlinear flow. So we did this guy already in detail. X dot equals X squared was that flow that gave uh, blow up in finite time. The eigenfunction worked out to be E to the minus lambda over X. And this is the eigenfunction. And it was a crazy eigenfunction because it had a uh, essential singularity at zero. And that essential singularity is actually not a, not a bug, it's a feature. It's gonna kind of correspond to the fact that you can't change a nonlinear flow into a linear flow anywhere you want. I'm gonna to try to change that guy into y dot equals y. So let's work, we worked that one too. That one has a Koopman Eigen function equation like this. The Koopman Eigen functions work out to be uh, y to the lambda. I'm gonna choose lambda equals to one to make life easier. And choosing land equals to one for both systems, G1, G1 was, G1, I'm choosing to be this guy, E to the, I'm choosing land equals one, E to the minus one over X. And uh, G2 will be this guy. So if G2 is this guy, I really want its inverse. Since it's the identity function for the simple example, the inverse is itself. So the H I'm claiming would be um, just G1. So in other words, E to the minus land over X, land is one. Let's see if it works. Is that, does that work as a diffeomorphism? So what I should check is, does it change variables? So plugging it into, um, I see what I get for Y dot. Y dot is going to equal to this guy. So that's the change of variables equation. So let's change Y dot equals DH of x, x dot, which is what this says, chain rule, but plug in wherever I see x, plug in h inverse of y, h inverse of y, x dot is my f. And sure enough, um, when I do that, the x squares cancel, uh, plugging in h inverse. If that's my h, its inverse would be minus lambda over log and the log, plugging a log in for an exponent, you get identity. So y dot equals y. So this does serve as a, um, a diffeomorphism that transforms x dot equals x squared into y dot equals y. It's fantastic. I just linearize the flow everywhere. So this is a different notion of linearizing than you would typically do if you're saying like keeping terms of a power series. Um, through Taylor series. This is actually linearizing through um, change of variables. Now, can I always do this? Can I do this everywhere? And of course the answer is no. 
because this thing is a mess. Um, this transformation is a mess at x equals zero. So I better stay away from x equals zero because this is highly, this is essential singularity at x equals zero. So where can I do it? It turns out that this, the domains and ranges match up nicely. If I either choose x to be in the positive um, real axis or I choose it separately to be in the negative real axis, then I can match things up in the right way. And, um, and that's no surprise. I can't really linearize a flow near zero because at, at zero is where x dot equals x squared and y dot equals y are really essentially different. Um, I can even carry that guy all the way to the integrated flow, which would be y dot equals one, which is what you would typically do when you're doing integrability or rectifying, or you know, in uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, it goes by action angle variables uh, formulation. Um, so solving this guy by the uh, Koopman PDE, or in this case, differential equation, I got grad g dot f equals um, dg dy1 equals lambda g, easy to solve. Um, g, uh, g of x is equal to, oh, that should be an x. g of x equals e to lambda x. Um, doing like I said before, g2 inverse um, uh, composed with g1. So inverting that guy is a log, right? And then plug in the E, and then you simply get minus ratio eigenvalues over X. And we choose um, the same eigenvalues for simplicity. So minus one over X. So minus one over X, you can check that Y equals minus one over X transforms um, eventually the X squared into the, um, equation y dot equals one. So there we go. We integrated um, x dot equals x squared by transforming it into y dot equals one and all the excitement came in collecting the change of variables as opposed to um, doing it directly to the vector field through a, uh, a Taylor series. This is a kind of a different way of working through things. Okay, what about multivariate? So I showed you at the beginning, I showed you this guy, which was my motivation. And the multivariate is going to be very similar, except I've got two eigenfunctions, at least two. So the change of variables had better be at least um, multivariate. So a, a transformation from the space, a two-dimensional space to a two-dimensional space better have two components. So I, I realized that the um, way you can build two components is what I call a matched set of eigenfunctions. And there's, condi there's technical conditions to have a matched set of eigenfunctions. But essentially what I did is I choose eigenfunctions, meaning um, scale, eigenfunctions go from um, the space to complex numbers. So I'll, um, they're single variate. So I choose a, a number of single variate eigenfunctions and enough to have their tangent space tan um, span the phase space. So in this case, two two eigenfunctions, they want to span the phase space. So the way to, the technical way I say that, it's not shown on this slide, is I, I say make sure everywhere that the level sets are transverse. And so in that statement in 2018, where I had the kernel of an idea for what I showed you as the first part of the talk. But anyway, choosing such a set of eigenfunctions, then you do otherwise, now have a vector value function, do the same for both spaces and do the composition thing again. G2 inverse composed of G1, where G now is a, a stack set of eigenfunctions. Again, even more so the worry about domains, ranges, and, and uh, non-uniqueness. But anyway, with the example I showed you, um, this one, um, you can work out its eigenfunctions by the Koopman PDE, grad g dot f. This is grad g dot f. It's a scalar equation. It's an ugly polynomial mess in uh, unknown function g, partial g x1, partial x1, partial g, partial x2, equals lambda g. Solve it by means I'm hiding from you. It's actually just method of characteristics. Here's one solution, and here's another solution. So I did some uh, fancy stuff behind the scenes to find two simple looking solutions and I showed you the level sets. So this is what I showed you earlier. So now I've got those and I'm going to try to match this system up against something simple. So I get to choose what's simple. 
So I'm going to try to match it against a system two, which is a linear system. So I'm going to try to match this guy to a linear system, which I'll call y dot equals ay. And I'm going to choose a to be a diagonal matrix with entries a1, a2. And um, that system two has eigenfunctions, which are observer functions. So it has one eigenfunction, which is observer in land and y, y1. It has another eigenfunction that's observer in y2. So this is just, these are two scalar functions. One just tells your, X, your, your y1 position, the other tells your y2 position. And I'm going to try to match these two systems by matching this set of eigenfunctions to this set of eigenfunctions. And that should presumably transform this equation into this equation. So um, this is a nice system to work with because G2 inverse, these being identity func like functions, it's component wise identities. When I compose that into um, this ugly eigenfunction, it just ends up repeating the ugly eigenfunctions. So actually these eigenfunctions, because I'm trying to match it to this system, end up serving as the, the H. So y equals h of x equals this thing would presumably serve as a change of variables that would transform this equation into this linear equation. And that was stated by theorem that are proved in the paper. But um, there's an old joke of applied mathematicians. You prove a theorem, and then you fire up the computer, and you check an example to see if it's true. In this case, you fire up an example and just kind of move some symbols around and see if it looks like it's true. Um, it is. I check y dot equals dh of x, x dot, where wherever I see an x, I'm going to plug in h inverse of y. And as ugly as this is, I designed it so that I could actually solve for h inverse of enclosed form. And uh, thank you, Mathematica. It helped me find this. But this is the inverse of that thing. So I can plug in h inverse for all the x's that show up. So dh of x, h inverse, f, plug it into the f, the h inverse. Following through the algebra, when I'm done, you get the other equation. y dot equals the other equation. This transformation does linearize the flow. And actually, this one's a diffeomorphism. So since this is a diffeomorphism, there's no problem. There's no worry about invertibility. Uh, excuse me, existence and uniqueness, not invertibility either. So this is a, um, a global transformation from uh, that funny equation into this linear equation. So that's fun. It all works. Um, I can try to change it into the in integrability form. So flow box would have me change it into y dot equals 1, 0 as the vector field. So that would be a flow that's just moving to the right in straight lines. Um, a little bit of a problem shows up here. So grad g, so this would be my second system. Grad g dot f is equal to, this is my PDE, partial g y1, 1, partial g y2, 0 is lambda g. And this has a solution um, like this guy. e to the lambda y1 plus an arbitrary function in Y2, if I choose a data surface that is transverse to the flow, that is just a vertical line. So the flow ends up not being able to distinguish um, uniquely um, a unique eigenfunction. There's still freedom in choosing Q. And this was the harbinger to some of what I showed you first part of the talk. Anyway, um, what, if I choose Q is equal to the identity function, following through like I did, um, you can actually change that original nonlinear flow all the way down to y dot equals one zero. Um, because the G2 inverse, um, in general, for a general Q, inverting this, we get this fun stuff in, in the logs and Q inverse with logs, as long as Q is invertible. If Q is identity, then I just have the stuff on the inside. If Q is not identity, then um, this G, so if it is identity, you get this is the, uh, the level sets. If uh, Q is not identity, I can get different forms. It's like I said, non-uniqueness. Um, with identity, you, you can follow your nose through the G2 inverse, compose the G, um, like I said, and um, the change of variables formula 
ends up giving me exactly what I wanted. But unfortunately, you have to know which queue to choose. So then it seems like perhaps they don't have a general method. Okay, so I'm going to try to wrap this up in just a couple minutes. This actually, that paper kind of goes on and on and on, and I'm going to not go on and on and on. I'm going to wrap this up in about five minutes. Uh, how I resolve the non-uniqueness issue. Long story short is I'm going to work the problem of finding the eigenfunctions in a in finite linear subspaces. So um, in specific subspaces, perhaps spanned by polynomials, that's the idea of Carmelin linearization. So you can interpret, um, I first learned this in the context of, like I said, I started out in Frobenius Perron world. Um, Ulam Galerkin method can be posed in this way. Um, uh, a lot of work has been done in terms of learning differential equations in this way. You can learn um, you can learn the transfer operators too in this way. So when I choose a good set of basis functions, then you end up projecting into a unique um, uh, transformation. So that's the long story. And the other part is that the operator is linear. And even in terms of the um, basis functions, the change of variables can be interpreted in terms of linear combinations compose onto the eigenfunctions. So all the steps I need to do for the change of variables ends up being just matrix operations. So there's a kind of a, a, a long and technical story to get that right. But um, I'm going to skip this slide because I'm going long. Um, the, uh, the, the long problem I showed you with this as the, uh, this as my vector field projected onto this as my basis set, the Koopman Eigen um, function equation ends up being um, just a um, um, functions map to functions according to, um, remember the, the grad of this vector field ends up being a linear operator, which can be represented in this space of functions as a matrix. So that it's a matrix shouldn't be a surprise because linear operators when you project onto basis, even infinite basis, basically give you a big matrix. Same for thing for the other system. And the other system was linear. I was trying to match it to this guy, and it ends up giving you a big matrix when projected onto these basis eigenfunctions. And so this is that matrix. The first is A1A2, then 2A1A, um, then sums, and then the other 2A2, and so forth. So once I have these guys as matrices, um, the transformation also ends up being able to be represented as a matrix. So that, there's kind of a long story about that in our, our uh, uh, 2018 paper. And then um, we went into a, um, a story, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude by um, just waving my hands at it. But we had had a previous paper before that where we were trying to find basis set for doing DMD, which were best in some way. Um, and we called that um, E DMD, so DMD with um, dynamic mode decomposition with, in terms of basis set is called extended dynamic mode decomposition. That's from 2014 or so. Um, that was Kevrikides, Rowley, and was Williams who was the lead on that. And then uh, the team I just showed you, which was me, uh, Chin Chow and lead, uh, Felix Dietrich and Giannis, we had done a um, EDMD with dictionary learning, which we called EDMD DL. And that ends up being a non convex optimization problem to find a DMD, which means max matrices, with respect to a best basis set. And being a non, um, a non convex problem, you need to solve it in some sense. We ended up solving that problem in a neural net, the details of which I'm going to wave my hands at. That in a neural net optimization problem for the best basis set, and it worked really well and it has been getting a lot of, of citations. There are a lot of different people now doing work comparable to that. Um, and the problem I'm showing you today, the way we did an EDMB DL for different, various different problems. Here it is for a uh, kramata sivazinski equation. Here's the exact solution. Here's our solution with just a few modes with best dictionary and versus a DMD in terms of state variables with lots more modes. Anyway, it's very efficient. Um, we ended up being going to make an AE DMD DL with 
matching, which is kind of a, a dual DMD variant, which means doing the optimization problem, but also trying to find good basis set to do that um, caramel and linearization thing so that everything reduced to matrices um, and find good basis set that really understand um, you're projecting the, uh, the transformation between spaces onto efficient basis set. So long story short, here's a, uh, and that ends up being an optimization in a, uh, a neural net. Uh, here's a Vanderpool system again. Here's a Vanderpool system. Here's a transformed version of a Vanderpool system that we set up so it looks very different. And the Vanderpool system has a limit cycle. The transform system is also re reversing time and it's also displaced. Um, setting up our dual EDMD problem. Here's a basis set shown as level sets, which are functions over the space x1, x2, over the space such that when I do what I showed you earlier, which was the uh, match, the change of variables through the q2 inverse q1, using this basis set, it beautifully transforms this guy back into that guy. And that's the punchline. <laughs> so the punchline is, um, I showed you a lot of different things about kind of non-traditional uses for uh, Koopman eigenfunctions. A lot of it had to do with um, understanding the geometry of the eigenfunctions, understanding the, uh, the level sets of the eigenfunctions. There's so many eigenfunctions, what's it all mean? Um, I showed you some integrability information is hiding in the eigenfunctions. I showed you some numerics. Um, I also, um, through uh, caramelization optimization, I just hinted at that. So more detail in the 2018 paper. And um, the sets of level sets I found very interesting and I packed that all into something I call primary eigenfunctions. So, well there. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks Any for questions? That. Hold on, I have, okay, someone raised hand. It'd be easier if you talk. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, you can unmute yourself and then talk directly. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah we don't hear you. George Han or can I ask a question? Yeah, 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 please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned this uh, algebraic method to generate new eigenpairs out of old ones by uh, essentially taking linear combinations of the eigenvalues. And um, maybe could, could you show the slide again? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna find it. So it's not a method, it's a property. Yeah. Uh, here it is. Yes. So this is the general statement. Exactly. So uh, I'm slightly confused by this because I would expect that this actually only works for integer alpha one and alpha two in general, right? Not for it real value. It, it works for any, but you need to be careful then as to um, what the domain would be. So this works as well as it's well defined. Yeah, but for instance, if the eigenfunctions phi lambda one and phi lambda two are complex valued, mm -hmm. then it's not clear how we can define the, the powers, right? So you had to choose a, a branch mm -hmm. of the logarithm, which means somehow that it restricts the domain of the eigenvalue. And so if, for instance, on the torus, on the complex unit circle, if you consider the rotation on L2, mm -hmm. then the spectrum is uh, the imaginary unit times the integers. And if you apply this method, you introduce a discontinuity in the eigenfunction, right. which is so, moves around. Yeah, that's, that's um, I'm forgetting a word, the Riemann surface. Yeah. So then this needs to be interpreted in terms of the Riemann surface. And even still, you need to stay in an open domain that, that stays away from that singularity. Yeah. So um, I kind of swept it all in an open domain U to declare that I want to stay away from that. So yeah. it, this is still relevant as long as you stay away from that singularity you just described. So you still get eigenfunctions, but the domain you may be forced to shrink the domain. Okay. So it works locally in, in space and also locally in time because the domain might not be yes. invariant under the flip. Right. Okay, and so thank you. And the, the longhand version is then you want to discuss eigenfunctions, not necessarily as an infinite time. That, that, was, that was, by the way, the case also for the eigenfunctions I was solving for the, the, um, by the, uh, the PDE I showed you. So those eigenfunctions are good in a domain U, and then um, and then you could flow out of its region where that eigenfunction statement stated, and you know, that low eigenfunction is no longer relevant. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Q, those, are called, those are called those are called open eigenfunctions. When you have eigenfunctions, that are only relevant for a finite time. Okay, great. Thank you. Pleasure. Good question. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, did you want to ask it directly, uh, Jose? Yeah, you can unmute yourself if you want. Yeah, anyway, he asked you about any examples in chaotic systems. What's the question? Yeah, any examples in chaotic systems? But I think you did with the uh, wonderful, right? Well, the Vanderpool I showed was not chaotic. That was just yeah. a 2D flow. But yeah. there's, there's nothing in this that prevents um, uh, chaos. I was, I, many of the examples I was presenting were meant to be solved in closed form, so I can kind of, I, I can show all the details. Um, there's, there's nothing technical that prevents chaos. I did show um, an example near the end, which is come out the Shvizinski equation, which is not just chaotic, but it's very high dimensional. We worked chaotic examples in other contexts, other people worked chaotic examples. So every, everything was relevant for chaotic examples. The only thing I, I put as hypotheses was about um, uh, uh, the regularity of, of, the, of the vector field. Any other questions? Actually, I'll mention, I'll mention one more thing, because chaos is a property for a long time. And I was getting myself out of trouble for part of the answer to the previous question about saying, well, you have open eigenfunctions in finite time. And those open eigenfunctions in finite time are relevant for the finite time. And then they also can produce um, change of variables in finite time. And so you're kind of skirting the whole chaos thing to the side if you're only discussing finite time. It might be a long time, but it's still finite time. Yeah, Emily, do you, I mean, yeah, just, just unmute yourself and ask him directly, right? If you don't mind. Emily Souther. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah. I, I was just listening to your last section about DMD with the, oh, with the dictionary learning. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering how that compared to the, um, the Cindy models that have come out recently as well for learning these terms. I know that there's some connections between the two and I always find it quite hard to separate them in my head. So I'd love to hear what you think. So um, Cindy is, um, is sparse regression projection of the ODE itself onto basis functions. And that has precursors that go way before that as well. Um, again, all the way back to Carmelin. But um, doing um, projection on the basis functions and learning ODEs. Um, first paper I saw on that was uh, a Crotchfield in 1987 with a, a least squares objective. And I have some old work on that. So that's one thing to do. What I showed. Um, was it's really EDMD, uh, extended dynamic mode decomposition, before you get to our dictionary learning, is projection of the Koopman operator onto basis functions. So they're both, one's projecting the, the, uh, the equations themselves, like x dot equals f of x, project the f onto basis functions. Um, that's where Cindy lives. That's where um, uh, Crutchfield's work lives. Um, then what I show for EDMD, well, I didn't show EDMD, uh, precursor, my EDMDDL is projecting the Koopman operator onto basis functions. And likewise, actually, Ulam's method in a way is uh, for Fibrinius prawn operator, uh, projecting the Fibrinius prawn onto basis functions. So other, other people have done that as well. So the EDMDDL that I show for dictionary learning is just solving then a, a variant of that problem, which says, great, now that I can project the, the, uh, the transfer operator or the evolution operator, onto basis functions. Maybe I can find a best set of basis functions that gives the best estimate for as few basis functions as possible. Um, and by the way, Cindy is not doing that either. It seems Cindy is, says, let me choose my set of basis functions and do a sparse projection onto it by a lasso regression, which means I'll truncate in a special way, but it's not, you pre-choose the basis set. Anyway, that's it. You project F, the right hand side of the vector field, or you project the evolution operator. So it's a, it's a different problem, but similar in spirit. Um, can you say the name of the paper again from 1987 that you mentioned? I said the name. There's a guy named um, Crutchfield, uh, James Crutchfield. Crutchfield. And then um, a bunch of people. I mean, 
I, I learned about the idea of it because it was used in control theory through caramel linearization in the 60s and 70s. And I learned it in school. I wrote a paper doing like that. That was like 2008 um, with lots of uh, like um, explicit analysis on conversions. So it was more of an analysis paper, but it had fully had the idea of projecting on the, the ODE, the right hand side of the vector field on the basis functions. Okay, thanks very much. Pleasure. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a quick question about like, uh, did you try on uh, this uh, example where there are resonances of uh, like uh, resonant eigenvalues? So it would I'm, be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding your word. Can you say it slowly? Yeah, yeah. Re resonant uh, eigenvalues. Oh, resonance, resonance eigenvalues. Yeah. Uh, so with, with this, um, and did you try on this kind of examples? Okay, did you see the phrase, um, you mean, what if I choose resonant eigenvalues? Yeah, it's not like if there is a, I mean, a system with, yes. with resonant eigenvalues. Yeah. But that, I'm gonna end up forbidding that. Um, ah, okay. So the, one of the conditions was I said a, um, a complete set of eigenfunctions, uh, and then the, the hypothesis I said to have a complete set of eigenfunctions is that their level sets are transverse. Okay. So a resonance would end up um, causing that um, hypothesis to fail, in which case I'd have to throw my hands up right away and say I can't do it, not by this method. Yeah, all right. It's a good question. Yeah. All right, then, so I think that uh, if there are no other questions, we can just thank you again. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's just so neat. Like, um, the pandemic's been awful, but all of a sudden, like, um, we're all on these Zooms all around the world. I'm watching talks all over the world, and here I'm giving a talk in London. And yeah. so, in a way, there's like a, a nice little side thing is I hope we can kind of keep uh, keep more in touch in the future. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the nice thing about it. Like, you have, like, globalization somehow helps in, in these yeah. countries. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. the classic, when life gives you lemonades, here's our lemonade. <laughs> okay, friends. I'll all see right, you. Okay. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.